Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody today. Um, welcome to Acts 11, 19 through 30, the church in Antioch of Syria. Acts 11, 19 through 30. Um, I'm excited about this because the whole theme of this particular passage of scripture is about movement and evidence of God's church um, just kind of forming and functioning and moving back out, uh, meeting needs, um, letting the gospel come alive in them in new ways. So good morning to all of you. Right off the bat in verse 19, it says, Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. So this is kind of the place where we'll be sitting for a little bit, that last place, Antioch of Syria. There were several places named Antioch, but um, this is the one that was sort of known to be a little lawless, more morally depraved. Um, they they were, uh, weren't were known for their uh, goodness and um, in word or deed uh, or thought. And so that's sort of where they head to when they're in persecution. They scatter and they move um, to that location, Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. So we remember yesterday... Um, Peter begins to say, hey, I, I got this word from the Lord and um, and confirms to those there that God is moving um, and prompting belief um, that salvation was meant for the Gentiles too. But here, uh, when they're preaching the word of God in Antioch, they're only preaching it to the Jews. It says, though, however, some of the believers who went to Antioch, Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them. A large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. So what's so interesting about this is um, that they were preaching initially only to the Jews, but then uh, as they go out and they start preaching to the Gentiles, they refer to Jesus as Lord. And this was important because up until then, um, you know, the Jews had been waiting for the Messiah. So Jesus was the Messiah to everyone that they preached to. Well, the context of a Messiah wasn't really necessarily um, beneficial to the Gentiles because they weren't looking for a Messiah in the same way that the Jews were. So here they're referring to um, Jesus as Lord. And that's because the Gentiles would use many other gods um, as to lord over them, to give their commitment to them, to try um, and gain whatever they needed. Uh, they would become lords or idols in their lives, and that's how they um, made those faith declarations were to all these idols. So when they came to preach the word of God, they came um, with the, a, a reference point that the Gentiles would understand. And I love this because we see Paul do this. Um, in 1 Corinthians 9.22, he says, I become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some. So he had talked before that about when, when I went to the Jews, um, I was a, a Jew. To those who were under the law, I was under the law, even though I'm only under Christ's law. To the weak, I became weak. So he really contextualized the culture that he was in so that he could save some. This is important as Christians. We have to contextualize um, based on the culture that we're living in, which is why when we go, we get a reference point and understanding of, of the Bible so that we can continue to move in the culture uh, around us. That's why we have to continually seek the Lord because the Bible is going to give us con context for where they were in their culture. And we have to take that and understand where am I, Lord? You've put me in this culture for such a time as this. What does it mean for me to carry the gospel of Jesus to the people that where you've placed me? How do I um, meet them right where they are? And how does your gospel answer the need of the culture right now? That's what we're putting together as Christians. So as believers, um, 
so that's what they were doing here as they go out to to meet the need of the Gentiles. And what's so interesting is that we don't know if the Gentiles of that time had heard about what had happened to Cornelius or had heard about what was happening um, with the other uh, believing Jews that now they they were willing to go out to the Gentiles, or we don't know if the Holy Spirit had prompted them and they had just started doing that as a confirmation and evidence of what the Lord was doing in other locations. So that's an exciting uh, question to ask. So they um, the power of the Lord was with them. Now, I want to ask, who are they? It says the power of the Lord was with them, but who are they? They are these anonymous groups of Christians that are um, sent out there and they're believing and they're uh, ministering and they're letting the gospel move forward. But we don't know exactly who they are. In fact, um, Jerusalem, in, from Jerusalem, the church there heard what was happening and they sent Barnabas, who we know his name. We know he was the son of encouragement. We saw him in Acts 4. Um, as this person who gave his wealth extravagantly um, to share in all of it, he he became a very um, important leader. So they send Barnabas to Antioch to, to help understand what's going on. So he sees evidence of God's blessing. And so this is where we see this movement and this evidence and this movement and this evidence. And it continues to prompt more and more movement and evidence of God. Um, you know, just tra transforming the entire earth. Uh, so Barnabas has a name, but the people that he goes to are just a group of people who understand the Lord. Some of those early Christians that were scattered there and, and the Lord was upon them. So it matters because oftentimes we will, um, decrease the voice and the power that God has given us because maybe we compare ourselves to someone else specifically, or we compare our region or our area with an, another place where we see God moving. Um, and so, so often people I've heard say, I should just really love this movement that God is doing in this area or region of the country or this area or region of the world or this time and place in history. And I so wish that God would do that here. And that is not a, a, a negative thing. That's spurring us on toward love and good deeds. And we want the movement of God fulfilled in us. Um, but there is something that starts individually, the movement in our heart that gives way to evidence that others can see that prompts movement in their heart. Um, the Lord is shifting something in our in us who may be nameless um, to move beyond what we see or what we long for over here the movement of god happens in us because we long for him and that changes the atmosphere that changes our region and our community and our city um, and our area our state our country our world those are the things um, when we long for and covet um, something that is happening over here, we may miss what God is doing right in the region that we are because he's put us where we are for a purpose. And this wasn't missed on the people of Antioch. And so when Barnabas went, he saw what God was doing. He encouraged what God was doing right there, which encouraged other ones and sort of spurred on the continuation of the movement of the gospel in greater form. Um, so just because they weren't part of the 12 apostles whom everybody know, knew and was trusting in, um, the work was still significant and effective. And a large number of people came to the Lord. So they are, Paul or Barnabas stays true to his name um, as he encourages them. And Luke tells us here that Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith. And many people, again, were brought to the Lord as he came over. Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. So after this, he goes to look uh, for Saul. And we don't know where Saul was at that time. But this, the, um, some historians say this could have been that 10 years um, where Saul was, you know, wanting that was learning and growing in faith. And um, so he goes to get Saul from Tarsus. 
Um, and when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch, both of them. And so that's where they start this relationship. And what's interesting is that here Bar we see Barnabas getting Saul. Later, we'll see um, Luke use Saul's name first or Paul's name and then Barnabas. And you see an equality of their names as they go on mission together. Um, that one was, uh, in our mind, perceived more important than another. And but really got... Luke shows each of them having a significant first title uh, equally. So Barnabas is named first eight times and Paul or Saul is named first eight times. And I think it's important for us because, again, we have an understanding um, and we try to rank everybody <laughs> in the Bible or in our lives or, or whatever. And God is saying, man, there is something unique and powerful that I've placed in you um, for where you are that will move my gospel forward. So um, our eyes are to be on him who is the greatest of all. So he goes and finds them. They come back to Antioch and they stayed with the church there for a full year ministering, teaching large crowds of people. And it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. So it becomes this anonymous group of people that then spurs on this greater movement because um, more come and add to that ministry. There's evidence of God working there. They move there um, and more movement comes and more movement comes and more evidence comes. So during this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the spirit that a great famine was coming upon the entire Roman world. This was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius. So this... Um, Parentheses here says that the thing that the thing that the prophet said, Agabus, was a, a um, you know, that it was coming, a prediction was happening, that a famine would come, that it was uh, going to happen, and this gives evidence that it actually did. So historians say that there was a, a, a scarcity of crops several times throughout the time of um, Claudius, and so we see the evidence there. And in preparation, the brothers and sisters in Judea, oh, sorry, in preparation, the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea, everyone giving as much as they could. So again, you see this evidence, this prompting of faith, this um, movement in the gospel saying, we trust the word of the Lord. We trust that God is doing something. We're not going to um, use any disdain to come against the prophets who are speaking. We're going to receive the word from them as trustworthy. And then we are going to move by the spirit. We're not going to move by our, what we see. We're going to move by the spirit. And I think this is important because often um, as Christians, we believe that there's some part of us that is immune to suffering in this world. And, and the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says we will have suffering, but to take heart that Jesus has overcome the world. And so when we see what's going on in our nation, we live in and around the world, we live in a place where there is suffering. Um, and so I've even heard people say that that can't happen to me because I'm a Christian. And what I would love for us to understand is that there Jesus has promised us joy in our suffering. He has promised us peace when we've been afflicted or um, in death. He's promised us um, eternity for those who believe in him. There is our, our abundant promises and blessing that he's afforded to us. We can't stick our head in the sand and say these things are not happening. But we do know that there is a hope and a peace that we carry that even when things get hard and even when there is suffering, there is great excitement and endurance and um and a, a charge to move ahead that is exciting, but it does allow us, because we know who God is and because we carry the Holy Spirit, there is some preparation and there is a, an understanding that we have that's beyond this world, that he can give us an, a, a warning and, and an understanding so that we can prepare and so that we can lead the world back to him to know all truth, um, who is truth. 
So that's what they're doing here. They're saying, I, I see something that's coming. Let's prepare because otherwise the people in this region are really going to suffer and they're not going to be able to make it through. And this portion of the church and the movement that's supposed to happen there will die if we do not respond. And that was the heart of what they were doing. They're responding because of what they see, the movement of God on Agabus um, and through the apostles. And in response, they move too, and then there's evidence of God's glory, that he is who they say he is, I and mean, he does what they say he'll do, what he promises that he'll do. So they did this, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. So the church, the elders governed the church in Jerusalem, which really stood as a beacon for um, that whole area. And also says the Bible tells us it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Um, there is a power in a name. Up until then, the people were called believers, brothers and sisters, disciples. Um, but here we see them being called Christians. And some of that meant that it was sort of a political play to um, make, section them off as a certain type of Jew. And so then maybe they didn't have to give as much uh, reference or regard to them as some of the other, um, as they did with some of the other sections of Jews or sects of Jews. But we know that that call or that word or that verbiage there has gone far beyond anything um, that they anticipated as we share that title now as Christians, as Christ followers, as people who um, love and honor and and let the Lord govern and rule our lives. He is our savior, um, just as those in Antioch preach to the Gentiles. We have now become a part of the, the Christians of this day um, and what God meant for all of, all of us to follow. So um, as we think about what it means to be called a Christian, what it means right now in the context of our culture, and what it means, what God intended for our, for us to be as believers. What does that mean for you? That was the, the charge today is what does it mean for you to be called a Christian? How does that change the movement in your heart, the, the welling up of what God is doing? And how does it give evidence to the culture around you? God's movement in you is significant. And God's evidence on display in you causes movement. It causes a shifting of things in here in Brandon, where we are and where we worship together. Um, but beyond, far beyond that, far beyond anything that we can think or imagine, your um, uniqueness in the body of Christ is not insignificant. It matters uh, and, and it prompts movement here. So I just want to encourage you with that word today. Let me pray for us. Thank you, Father, for your word. It's so rich, even in the places where we think, gosh, what are what are we supposed to gather from this? There is always something that you're prompting, a movement, a shifting um, for us to respond to, a call to more glory, Lord. And so we receive that call today um, as Christians, as, as your disciples, to just shift with where you are, to prepare for whatever you have for us, and to hear your word upon us, to be part of the culture here in the culture, to bring you um, higher and, and, and just for your word to go far beyond um, just ourselves, Lord. Let us not be a, a belly button culture, just looking looking to ourselves, Lord, or looking uh, just to you, but let us just connect with one another so that the movement can build movement, can build movement, and that momentum will change um, the culture with which we sit. So thank you, Father, for your word, and I just bless every single person listening and watching um, with your favor and your peace, Lord. May it be abundant. May your joy overflow in them. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day.